My name is Paula Bowman, and I was born on the 1st of June, 1922, in Yorkshire. I had a beautiful family. My father was in textiles, two girls and two boys in the family, which was really nice. So made me a wee bit of a tomboy, I'm afraid. And I was sent away to uh, a French convent at the age of seven. And uh, didn't like that at all, so... <laughs> I ran away a few times just to cause a sensation. I settled down after a few years. So I ended up by leaving after 10 years as head girl. So I was very proud of that. I was captain of the hockey team and I loved uh, netball too. I love netball. Every Saturday morning, we'd go on the beach. And if the tide came in, did batter the horses not being in there, a little bit of water. And then every year we'd have a gym carver, we'd have an egg and spoon race on horseback and oh I used to love love riding. I think I would have been about eight or nine or something. And I was dying for a pair of shorts. My father said, Girls don't wear shorts. So I got pretty sick about this and I said to my brother, can I borrow your cricket shorts? They have little white cricket shorts. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're in this very smart hotel in Belgium at the time. And uh, I put on these little white shorts and a shirt. I went down to breakfast. My father saw me coming in the dining room. He nearly died. He couldn't believe it. Couldn't really make a fuss in, in the restaurant. So after breakfast, he took me outside, got mother to get her little box camera to take a photograph of me with him. He had these long white flannels on and I had these little white shorts and I've got the photograph today, which meant a lot to me at the time. But in the end, it just gave up, I think, anything I wanted to do, because I'd do it anyway. <laughs> I don't think I was a very nice little girl, was I? Yeah? <laughs> anyway, um, leaving school, I wanted to study architecture, but my father said, girls don't do that. But if you really want to do it, if you go to a finishing school first in Denmark, and when you finish there and you still want to do it, well, we'll think about it. So, overnight, War was declared, and I had a cable from the Danish consulate to say, don't leave England, war is inevitable. And just as well, because they bombed Eshberg the following day, where I was to land. Because I can't be just idle, I went to the university and did a social diploma course, which is very interesting. And at night time, I used to work for the Red Cross. I volunteer and then I did weekends as well and it became a big thing in my life and uh, nurses were very very short in those days and so they asked us would we take an abridged nursing course and go to York Military Hospital so my friend Margaret and I decided why not we'll do this so we did. So we gave away everything we were doing and went to York Military Hospital. That was quite a <laughs> quite a difference in our lives, I can tell you. And uh, many, many homes in England were turned into camp reception stations, hospital relief, and we ended up in Hull where they were unloading hospital ships and there were bee bombs coming over in Hull, which was pretty terrible. So that was quite terrifying. But uh, anyway, we, we, we were young and we coped pretty well. But it was a lot of experiences for a girl that had just left school. And I met a lot of girls that I normally wouldn't have met. One of the places that we were moved to was Rexford Hall, which was a beautiful old home that had been given over 
by the master of the hunt, and the main homestead, of course, was the hospital. There's a photograph of me, actually, looking out of the window. The stables underneath were full of ambulances, and we were bulleted where the grooms would be. Your sugar ration was in a little jar. We had three little jars on the table in front of you. One for your sugar, one for something else, one for something else, with your name on, and that was yours for a month. That was to last a month. But everybody was healthy. We were all slim and we had enough for our energy. It was just, it was an amazing ration. Mm. And I always said if they put that ration into a book and sold it mm. for diets, that's not what they did. One day they had a, a message from the local aerodrome saying they were having a party in the best. And uh, would they send over five nurses or whoever was off duty to join the party for obvious reasons? And uh, so Margaret and I were off duty and we were one of the five. We went there with an escort, a matron, very strict matron. And we were formally introduced to the, all the fellows, which today would be unthinkable. But that's, that's the way it worked. And of course, being well brought up young ladies, we danced with whoever we were introduced to. And then halfway through, then we changed partners. And that is how I met my future husband, because Margaret's partner was given to me, and that was it. She never got it back again. <laughs> his, name was, his name was Arthur Bowman. So that was the beginning of the, the romance, really. And um, it was a long way from town where we used to go to the, uh, there was a pub there. And one day he said, do you think you could come next time without uniform? They'd seen nothing but uniform for so long and just wanted women to look like women. I said, Mark, but have you got anything else that was the uniform? Because we suppose we had to go out in our uniform. And uh, I said, oh, I've got a, a jumper and I've got a tweed skirt or something. That'd be very exciting because we didn't have in those days. And uh, so we did. And uh, my hair was down here, page boy, you know. So I just put a bit of ribbon, a bit of uh, navy blue ribbon around my head. Oh, we had to cycle into town. Oh, Teddy, you have no idea. In pitch dark, and we would we had these little uh, lights on the front of the bicycles with shutters on because the, it had to do that. That's all you were allowed. At night, in the dark, okay, in the in the camp, all the way from. Uh, Rakesborough Hall, what the fuck? Rakesborough Hall, all the way down. We left our bikes outside the hall there. And then we had to cycle home at midnight. <laughs> up, it was uphill all the way. Oh, I'll never forget that. And then we were posted elsewhere over to Ely. And so that was the end of that for a while until I had a, a message from Arthur, my future husband. Uh, to say that he was getting leave and could I get leave? And I wrote back and said, no, I couldn't get leave at all during that period. So he said, oh, well, I'm coming over anyway. And I was stationed at this time in the Bishop's Palace in Ely, which was absolutely beautiful. And there was a big garden seat there, and he used to sit on that seat and wait for me to come off duty. Uh, I said, you've got leave, yes. Well, where, are the, where is your crew? Oh, they've all gone up to London. I said, well, why aren't you going up to London? Well, I didn't want to go. I wanted to come and see you. So that was really the beginning of things, I think. So anyway, he was a pilot and he'd been into Bomber Command and he'd been over to Europe and he was 
partly traumatized at times himself, but nobody called it that in those days. They were just said they were tired and yeah, needed a break. He was in what they call Wellington Bobbers. I saw the Wellington setting off one night to go over to Germany and they were fabric and they were literally shaky. Awful to think that men were saving their lives in these machines. Anyway, he was soon transferred to the Lancasters, which were much superior. They really saved the war. Wonderful machine. Mother was working the Red Cross, uh, only really manages these, but she was doing something mm -hmm. for the Red Cross. Everybody was doing mm -hmm. something. And then if, uh, or uh, say, we have a housemaid and, and another one, you know, but they had to go on, they went on munitions. So that's how we ended up with just Betty. My brother, Desmond, aged 22, a fighter pilot, was killed in Burma. And that was demonstrating for my parents, absolutely demonstrating. The government wanted me to take compassionate leave to try and do something with my parents. Because my father, who was a workaholic, was just sitting, traumatized. And my mother the same. They weren't drinkers, so they weren't even drinking. They just had cups of tea and sitting, looking at one another. That was all. Didn't, didn't move from the house. So anyway, after a little while, I did eventually get my father back to work. It was Christmas time, and uh, I suggested to my parents that I had this lonely Australian who had nowhere to go for Christmas. And how about, you know, I said, how about would it be in, in order to have it for Christmas? Oh, yes, said my father, provided you don't get fond of the fellow. Neely said, it's too late for that, but I didn't. Anyway, eventually, I did get him over to Beach Lodge, my, my home. We went into Leeds just to do a bit of looking at the shops and have a cup of coffee and things like that. And over the cup of coffee, suddenly Arthur said to me, when are you going to marry me? And I said, Oh, uh, why? And he said, well, when, when, when are you going to marry me? And that was the proposal. That's all he said, as if to say, I know you want to, you know. <laughs> That's all he said. So anyway, we decided there and there we wanted to become engaged. So when we got back to Beach Lodge by home, uh, he asked to speak to my father. So he was locked in the, in the dining room with my father and put through the gamut, I might tell you. And he was there for ages and I was sitting on the stairs outside thinking, goodness me, this is going on for hours. So the poor man really went through it with my father's questions. But in the end, he won him over and we were allowed to become engaged. So that was the beginning of everything. My father made the stipulation. We were allowed to become engaged provided uh, we didn't get married till after he'd fled his complete tours over Germany, which was understandable having lost my brother. And uh, also my father wasn't too keen on me going to Australia. So he sent to my future husband, he said, would you like to stay in England? And he said, well, yes, I could do that and continue with my accountancy after the war. And my father said, well, if you do that, I can article you to an accountant in Leeds and, uh, you know, your future will be assured. So anyway, I was asked about this and I said, I don't marry an Australian to expect him 
to stay in my country. If I'm marrying an Australian and he wants to go home, where his inheritance is, that's where we should go. After we had been given the okay to get engaged, my father, of course, to leave no stone unturned, decided to put a solicitor onto the Bowman family with which I was marrying into to find out something about them. And uh, unbeknownst to him, my, mo my future mother-in-law was doing the same thing. And to my amazement, I never knew until many years later that they were both using the same solicitor. Freddie was my matron of honour, didn't have any bridesmaids, just my matron of honour, which was my sister, because she was already married. I had nothing to wear. For, I mean, I didn't have go to a couture and have a wedding dress made. We just bought something off the peg, literally, uh, and they had to have coupons. So the family uh, gave me some of their coupons, so eventually we had enough coupons to buy the dress. I wasn't really fussed what I wore, to be honest. No. But there's quite a nice shot, quite a photograph, isn't it? All the ones in the Australian uniform. There's two, I think, in two in English uniform, mm. the lighter colour. And then on the other side, there's Malcolm and Freddie and, and the rest of the, the crew. Many moons later, of course, I became pregnant with my first son, Arthur. And so I got maternity leave. That was really nice to be home with my parents. But uh, they thought I was very silly to have done that. But anyway, they knew they would never stop me doing whatever I wanted to do. They never could. So <laughs> for us to get to Australia, I had to go on what they call the bride ship. And I couldn't tell you the performances that went on that ship. It was delayed for two weeks because there were so many children that they decided they ought to have a, a child specialist on the ship. But actually, I think they were waiting for the doctor to qualify because his knowledge was nil. My father drove me up to Southampton to get on the Stirling Castle. And uh, when we got down, he said, my dear child, you must love him a lot to do what you're doing. Getting on that ship, you don't know where you're going to with a little boy. He said, you just must be the right person. So that was, he was obviously, he'd lost his son and now he'd lost a daughter. So I could understand his sadness, really. I said to my father, uh, please don't ask for any special things on the ship for me. I've got to go the same as all the other girls. Little mm -hmm. did I realise who the other girls were, but he must have done something because I had a cabin with a, a, a hook on bassinet for, for the baby and only one girl who didn't have a child in, the, in this cabin and I had my bathroom as well. Now, most of the girls, there were five to a cabin with children. I don't know how they managed, but so many of them were so dreadful. These girls used to lock their children in the cabins. There were a lot of toddlers, lock them in the cabins and sleep with the officers. And as for hygiene, it, there was nil on the ship. They didn't even bother to wash the napkins. No disposable in those days. Anyway, it ended up by getting this terrible gastroenteritis. And uh, my, I befriended one girl who had married a teacher in Melbourne. And she had a little girl called Betty. Same age as Arthur. About nine months, I think she was. And uh, she died on the way at Fremantle. Must have been devastating to that girl to land and tell her husband that the baby had died on the way. You know, must have been 
horrified. Well, Arthur got very sick, but he, he looked very healthy. When I left, he was a big bouncing boy, and therefore he had a lot of persistence. He was never a weakling. And so when we came off the ship in Sydney, we had to line up to have a health test. And the doctor looked at Arthur and said, well, you're a healthy young man. And I just said, yes. I made out he was very healthy because I just couldn't get ashore quick enough because I knew the doctor was no good. So anyway, Arthur alerted his, when I arrived, he alerted his uh, uncle, who was Dr. Dougal Bowman, who immediately got a bed at Children's Hospital, Pratt Camperdown, and Arthur was taken there. And when he arrived, he was very ill. And they said to Arthur and I, don't leave the hospital, sleep at the chair tonight. We don't like your chances. So that was pretty devastating. Anyway, um, in the morning, this little cheeky boy was sitting up in the cot, giving the nurses and clapping and going on. It was dehydration. And the poor child was given the intravenous and he was cheeky and sitting up in the morning and he was absolutely fine. It was pure dehydration from the gastroenteritis. Anyway, that w we were very lucky that uh, we got him to hospital in time. And then Block Hall was a tiny apartment, but it was ours and, and it was just a lovely to have it. But I had no laundry. It was just a, a bathroom, a bedroom and a living room and a balcony which we, the balcony had a piece of awning that came down. And that is that we put the awning down and we put a cot for Arthur on the balcony and he literally slept on that balcony all the time. That was his room. It was a little kitchenette. There was a little fridge and a little stove and everything was tiny. And I wasn't a cook anyway. I'd never cooked in my life. Uh, passion fruit. I didn't know what they were. And I said, what are those? They said, oh, absolutely delicious. Put them into the fruit salad. So I said, oh, all right. So <laughs> he said, well, what are you doing in the kitchen for so long? I said, this stupid fruit you brought. I said, by the time I've taken the pips out, there's nothing left. <laughs> We'd been in Sydney for quite a while, and it was time we felt that I met my mother-in-law. So we didn't have a car, so we went by train to Singleton in the hottest day ever, I think it was 103 in the shade or something, uh, with this little boy in, in the train. And we got to Singleton to be greeted with my mother-in-law, who was very voluptuous and rather frightened, the little boy. But anyway, it was my first encounter with my mother-in-law and uh, she had this Jaguar car, put us into the Jag, sat in the back of the car with a little boy who was dehydrated at this stage on a dirt road all the way to the property. I thought we were never getting there because I wasn't used to the Australian countryside. The homestead and three share farmers houses. They were all into dairy, beautiful property, and with the Hunter River running down the, the bottom of it. The the property was left to to my husband at the age of six. His father died when he was six and his he was the only boy it was to go to him, but uh, as they did in wills in those days uh, it was left to my mother-in-law for her lifetime. And uh, and that, that was the way they made wills in those days. And so as long as she didn't marry, it was her property. But if she married, which she never did, uh, it was to go straight to the sun. Anyway, one day 
Arthur came home from work. He was in the uh, Le Maestro Walker in Sydney. And he said, would you mind going to live in the country? And I said, well, I've come across the world. What's, what's the difference? Living in the country was quite a new thing for me. I wasn't experienced at all, but you learn pretty quickly. The country friends that we made have been with me for the rest of my life. I mean, that most of them have passed away now, but we've had some amazing times with them. I cannot believe that I am still here 30 years after my husband passed away. We were the same age. We were both 70 when he died, which is pretty dreadful. And then later, my son, Arthur, he passes away, same age, 70. It's, it's been the tragedy of my life. Really. It's a bit difficult, but I, I still have, I'm still fortunate enough to have my son Anthony and my daughter Tina, 10 grandchildren, 16 great grandchildren, which means I've got 26 grandchildren, which is not too bad. Although I haven't lived 100 years, so. That's my reward, I expect. Ever since childhood, I've been interested in art. We had a, a really nice studio when I was at school, and, and my happiest time was when it was an art day and we could go in there and paint. And I did, uh, my first painting was a, a ship on the shore at Farley Beach. And I've still got the painting today in 1937 or 36 or something, which makes me about 12. When COVID started and there was isolation, I had a lot of friends who were in retirement homes and, or nursing homes and uh, weren't as fortunate as me. And you couldn't visit them because of COVID. So I started doing little cards, painting images on cards and drawing flowers and birds and things and sending them these cards. Favourite house. A lot of my friends would say, what do you do all day? It's so boring when there's nothing on television. I said, television? I don't get near the television set till the news, seven o'clock news. And they say, well, what do you do all day? I said, I, I draw and I paint and carry on. And I said, I find it very interesting. And I said, I've got really carried away. I said, I've got a whole big album of them now. That's a different look, which is interesting. I suppose you want to do other things. I, I just can't not do something every day. So I said, it's given me a great interest and I wouldn't be without it. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>